every cell needs to kind of produce energy to be for an organism to be able to survive. So we're going to look at some of those organelles responsible for producing some of that energy. In plants, we have most notably the chloroplast, and then we have everyone's favorite, the mitochondria. So first off, chloroplasts are the, uh, contain chlorophyll, those green pigments that allow to capture solar energy. And you can see even with a light microscope, you can easily pick them out and see them as they're very well defined in the cell. Now chloroplasts, what's unique about them is that they are, they are mobile. They can actually change position to maximize their ability to capture sunlight. So uh, top view here and kind of sideways view in uh, dark environments, those chloroplasts will move kind of towards the top so that they're able to try to maximize as much light as possible. And if there's too much light, they can actually move to the side or kind of work their way through um, the, um, the cell, so a little bit more diffuse. But when they want to maximize the light absorption, they can actually move within the cell. Now these chloroplasts originated as um, endosymbiotic cyanobacterium. So they retain their own independent genome and there's some evidence to suggest they may have once been free living and are now through the endosymbiotic theory are now components in particular of plant cells. So now these chloroplasts have a triple membrane structure, they have an outer and an inner membrane. This again is part of the reason why uh, the theory is that they may have been once free living because they already have a membrane structure. This siliquid forms disc-like um, structures which are stacked in the form of grana. These kind of stacks allow for a very efficient surface area to volume ratio to allow for exchange of materials. Um, and they're suspended within the semi-fluid of the stroma, as we can see here, and also located here. Now there's a lot of chemical reactions as I mentioned, so we want to be able to have a lot of surface area for them to occur. This is a zoomed in version here, again showing you kind of these like discs that are on top of one another, allowing for that a lot of area for these uh, chemical reactions to occur, which are very important because we want to be efficient with our energy production within the cells. Now chloroplasts, as we're probably most familiar with, a uh, process of the photosynthetic process uh, involved with taking carbon dioxide, uh, water with light energy, and producing sugars and oxygen as a byproduct. Only plants, algae, and certain bacteria are capable of going through this process. Chlorophyll and other pigments capture solar energy, and enzymes are ultimately used to synthesize carbohydrates or sugars. Now this site of photosynthesis, their carbohydrates um, are being formed from carbon dioxide and water, uh, cells making its own food using this, carb using this carbon dioxide here. We can see that kind of membrane here and this exchange that's occurring. Uh, this photon energy, this light energy is driving the breaking down of water, producing oxygen, these hydrogen ions, which are ultimately being used to produce ATP and NADPH, both energy molecules, um, and being used to synthesize or create carbohydrates. Now that structure here, as I mentioned, the stroma, the aqueous fluid, we see the thylakoid, we see the grana, um, the thylakoid being the individual component, the grana being a stack of those thylakoids, and the multiple membranes here. We also have the lumen, which is the um, kind of semi-fluid area located within the thylakoid. Now we get on to the mitochondria. Um, it's originated also as an endosomatic um, eubacterium, in the sense that it has its own DNA and it has multiple uh, layers, multiple membranes, indicating it may have once been free living. The mitochondria are smaller than a chloroplast and they contain ribosomes in their own DNA and they remain an independent genome. And it's highly variable among species. So that's kind of interesting fact about the mitochondria. It's involved in cellular respiration, uh, produces most of the ATP utilized by the cell. Uh, a lot of people say it's, you know, it's the powerhouse of the cell. Well, it's really the site of cellular respiration or the breaking down of sugar to form energy. So mitochondria is surrounded by this double membranes, an outer and an inner, much as we saw with the chloroplast. Uh, these folds, again, allow for a lot of surface area to volume ratio. Um, the cristae surrounds the matrix. The matrix is the inner semi-fluid containing respiratory enzymes, these proteins involved in this energy production process. And how they're generating that energy is by breaking down carbohydrates. This energy production that occurs um, is fatty acid metabolism. There's also the Krebs cycle or the citric acid cycle. And it's through the process of what's called oxidative phosphorylation. You're having these kind of all these components within these uh, membranes going through and isolating different uh, components, allowing them to create gradients to then ultimately generate ATP, which is the energy currency of the cell. 
Uh, lastly, as I said, that mitochondria, it's the site of cellular respiration or it's the site of ATP synthesis. Uh, powerhouse just kind of cuts it a little bit short for what it's actually able to produce. It, it's a double membrane. This is kind of what they look like. I'm looking at a transmission electron microscope. Uh, there's cristae, there's folds in there. Um, there's enzymes in there help to break down all those carbohydrates um, and ultimately producing ATP, which is the energy currency of all cells and vital for life. Keep in mind that animal cells and plant cells both have mitochondria, while plant cells and algae are the ones that only have the chloroplast.